Hi, I'm Annette Gendron, uh, pathologist and director of the Research Animal Resources Center at the University of Wisconsin and member of the Board of Directors of the Charles Lewis Davis Foundation. Um, today we're, I'm giving a lecture on the pathology of non-human primates, in particular um, trying to combine both the pathology of the laboratory animal and the zoological species as board exams and many people see these animals in both conditions. Um, for the first, perhaps now we can have the first slide. Gross pathology of non-human primates. We're going to go through this in systems. What we're going to do is cover the various animals, uh, non-human primates in three groups, the macaques, the calatricids, and the other exotic uh, primates, starting with the skin and subcutaneous tissue. The first slide represents the rhesus macaque, one of the most popular species used in, in research colonies. It is a, in this picture you see a representation of the sex skin in the uh, primate. These manifestations of, in the female primate are known to change with the ovulation cycle at, ovula at or before ovulation they usually peak and the particular look or manifestation is different for each of the different species. The second example of sex skin is that of a pigtailed macaque. Moving to um, viruses manifested in the skin, we have a cel infant Celebes macaque that was part of a group with an outbreak of the varicella zoster complex. This group includes the um, Delta, Lake Murray macaque, and Pottis uh, varicella, uh, varicella, simian varicella viruses. In this particular picture, we can see a close-up of the papular or vesicular-like lesions which tend to burst and crust over. These can become very numerous and also quite irritating, particularly in areas of around the genitals or the oral cavity, making it difficult for the animal to nurse. In this Japanese macaque, we can see an excellent example of a unopened vesicle here, as well as some of the excoriated lesions. This is an old picture, but uh, represents a in Yaba virus infection. This particular infection is zoonotic. It is one of the few pox virus infections which infects histiocytes rather than epithelial cells. It is often known as the dermal histiocytoma. It is a subcutaneous nodule that will not only grow rapidly but also sloughs and regresses. It is seen in humans as well as rhesus and baboons and is carried by a mosquito vector. The next slide represents a manifestation of cutaneous tuberculosis. Tuberculosis, as it is seen in both non-human primates and man, can show up in areas other than as a respiratory infection, i.e. mammary glands, ovary, vertebrae, and in this case, the skin. This is not leprosy, which is a, obviously another condition, but is seen as a focal granuloma within the skin. The lump seen on the finger here represents the cutaneous tuberculosis. The next few slides demonstrate staphylococcal um, granulomas or cutaneous dermatitides in the uh, non-human primate. Staph infections can be quite serious in primate colonies, not only because of the irritative effects of the skin conditions, but also because they often become septicemic. In septicemic conditions, you're dealing with staphylococci that will act through either extracellular toxins or perhaps hypersensitivity to the cell uh, protein A, or in inhibition by um, the cell wall on the host defenses, period. The, um, following slides show the typical presentations, usually on the digits, almost always trauma-induced. 
here and here. Also on the hand, this can be abraded. Staphylococci then becoming in, in cultivate uh, growing into the, the the abrasion. It can also be seen in um, other areas of the body. This is an old slide. It demonstrates a an example of mucormycosis. This is an old case. This animal was known to have diabetes and the infection appears to have started as a pustular dermatitis which then eroded through into the orbit and as well as the sinuses. The nor uh, more commonly perhaps mucor is seen as a GI lesion, however, usually this is precipitated by situations of stress, quarantine, capture, etc. The next slide represents an infant rhesus macaque that was found severely anemic and, and very moribund. It was euthanized and presented for necropsy. The animal was almost covered with lice. They can be seen with difficulty, but if one visualizes the small white spots on the fur, all these represent the lice infestation. The species here is Petacinus obstusus. The interesting thing about these infections, which are considered relatively rare, is that normally, as in this case, only, it may only be a single or only a few animals affected, and the other animals in a community group may, not sh may show not only no s clinical sign of itching, scratching, or lice infestation, but on close examination may not even carry any lice. The next slide represents a uh, penile squamous cell carcinoma in a rhesus monkey and can be seen as a proliferative and excoriative lesion on the end of the penis. This uh, picture is of pigtailed macaque showing a uh, good demonstration of why or how they get their name. The pigtail macaque or macaca nemestrina is particularly known for this or manifesting this lesion which is one of a group of conditions known collectively as retroperitoneal fibromatosis seen in patients exhibiting SRV infection in this with this particular um, condition you see the fibrous nodules under the skin in the subcutaneous tissue these can be retroperitoneal as well as under the skin of the arm or other uh, locations on the body. They're associated usually with SRV infection serotype 1. This picture, while um, not particularly easy to see, represents an owl monkey with herpes T, a condition not commonly seen. There is a small vesicle and excoriative lesions noted on the skin. This is to remind me to mention that the herpes infections in the New World monkey can be just as fatal for other species. In other words, the herpes T infection, which is latent and rarely uh, becomes a clinical uh, disease in squirrel monkeys, when exposed to owl monkeys and marmosets can create a fatal septicemia with erosions and ulcerations of the tongue and oral mucosa. This sequelae from mixing of the species is not uncommon with viral infections in the primates and also can be um, seen in the condition of the simian B virus noted in, in macaques that is fatal for humans while usually latent within the um, old world macaques. The same thing applies in reverse in that the herpes simplex viruses that usually cause only mild cold sores in humans can cause a fatal septicemia with again erosions of the tongue and oral mucosa in non-human primates. The potus monkey 
as demonstrated here, has it, its own varicella virus. This is a histological representation and shows the epithelial proliferation and the uh, herpetic inclusion bodies noted within the skin. This particular varicella vi um, virus is most similar to the human varicella zoster and there is a tendency for the virus to become latent within the ganglion. These next two slides represent chimp, uh, monkey, uh, chimpanzee with monkeypox. This is an orthopox. It starts as papules proceeding to pustules which then ulcerate and crust over. This is more common in the central and western Africa but both old world and new world monkeys are susceptible to this disease. It's a sporadic infection rather than endemic and perhaps of most concern is the fact that this pox virus very closely resembles smallpox and the smallpox vaccination protects humans from the zoonotic risk of monkeypox infection. It is, one has to speculate that with the um, stopping of give the smallpox vaccine, the ceasing of uh, the giving of smallpox vaccine in humans, that there may very well be, and certain indications are that there already is an increase in the incidence of monkeypox in the human populations in areas that are exposed to these non-human primates. In other words, it could represent another emerging disease. This is the flat raised lesions with the central ulcera ulceration seen in monkeypox as and with the papules, early papules also represented in the oral mucosa. This is a white fa faced sake. The skin in the abdomen of this animal shows a white crusty flaky lesion that is irritated and often hyperemic. The animal can scratch at it. In this case what we're looking at is a, a representation of a case of seroptic mange. This is a ring-tailed lemur, an animal commonly kept in uh, zoos for its playful nature and um, active uh, in activity levels. They are also seen in uh, several research colonies now. This particular animal was kept in the uh, Milwaukee Zoo. It's noted to be older and quite obese. In this slide you can see the sort of lumpy multinodular nature to the fat of the animal which when the skin is sized demonstrates multiple nodules of lipomatous, small lipomas underneath the skin. This is the um, genital region of a female bonobo or pygmy chimpanzee. These nodules represent papillo genital papillomas. They are known to be of viral origin and are quite commonly seen right at the entrance to the genital tract. Um, this is uh, simply a demonstration of um, the technique used in TB testing the non-human primates as most often these animals need to be rest restrained or even anesthetized to carry out this procedure. It is not considered uh, practical to have to anesthetize them each day to read this exam also. It's done on the eyelids so that they can be easily read from a distance, perhaps with a set of binoculars. The same criteria of induration and hyperemia apply. What we can see here on the eyelid of this drill is a um, immediate t reaction to a uh, TB test. Moving to the cardiovascular system. In the macaque group, we see a number of um, cases of endocardiosis in the older rhesus macaques. Rhesus are often used many times for different procedures. And after 14, 15 years on up, you, uh, 
you often see both incidentally and causing cardiac disease these multinodular proliferations along the valve leaflets, in particular, or perhaps most, perhaps most popularly along the mitral valve, combination of collagen and acid mucopolysaccharide. If you look careful, there, carefully, there are some pale streaks in the myocardium that represent foci of cellular infiltration, usually mononuclear, myofiber fragmentation, and perhaps mineralization. This cardiac degeneration is results often in uh, cardiovascular compromise. If the valve leaflets are severely affected, there's going to be valvular insufficiency. This slide um, of a synomologous monkey represents a chronic fibrosing pericarditis. Chronic condition actually in the end stages or reparative stages, which has come, become a fibrotic adhesed membrane that now is thickened and tightly applied to the outer epicardium and cannot actually in many cases even be separated from the epicardium. You can see uh, sections of the heart here. The problem that occurs is that this becomes constrictive and the heart can no longer expand and adapt and often you get cardiac arrest in a manner similar to that with cardiac tamponade. The object of looking at gross pathology slides is to identify the tissue and then perhaps and to come up with the most likely diagnoses that produce the particular lesion seen. In this case, we can notice the liver and with some fibrin adhered, the edge of the rib cage and an extremely thick fibrinopurulent proliferation not only over the entire heart but also across the um, pleura. This is a fibrinonecrotic or fibrinosuppurative pericarditis. It's caused by Haemophilus influenza. The condition seen here which sort of resembles uh, the pericarditis a uh, sort of a rug-like prolif uh, proliferation is often called core rugosum. In the calotrichids, this is a Geldes marmoset, which is, was uh, necropsied and identifying the lesions here is fairly easy in that the heart silhouette appears to take up almost the entire thoracic cavity with just a peek at the lungs around the edges. The liver is pale but somewhat enlarged and the pools of blood stand out suggesting chronic passive congestion. The examination of the lungs is difficult but there appears to be a sort of wet appearance to them as well as pale coloration suggesting possible pulmonary edema with a cardiomegaly and chronic passive congestion of the liver, what we see represents most likely a case of congestive heart failure and histopathology confirmed this diagnosis. Common causes of um, this is a, of this condition uh, in cotton top marmosets and let's take a look at this slide first uh, where we see a vegetative endocarditis with a thrombus on the leaflets of the mitral valve. Uh, if endocarditis or inflammation would be implied if they were inflammatory cells or um, infectious materials involved in this thrombus. In cases of a endocarditis organism such as strep haemophilus parainfluenza, which is known to cause an endocarditis, and E. coli can be cultured from these lesions. This marmoset shed small thrombi, or I'm sorry, small emboli from this thrombus, resulting in a, a thromboembolic disease throughout the rest of the animal. Moving on to the western lowland gorilla, or the, uh, the uh, more exotic non human primates. 
A gorilla at the Milwaukee Zoo was seen to show a um, left arm weakness that proceeded to deteriorate and to a CNS condition. Um, the animal was MRI'd in, as far as the brain in the second uh, set of MRIs. It was noted that there were prominent brain lesions and a possible fungal encephalitis was diagnosed and treated. However, there was little response. The animal appeared to, to continue to deteriorate and was finally euthanized. At necropsy, it was found that um, there were large fungating lesions in, on the heart and pancreas. As you can see here, there's a large proliferative multinodular lesion at the apex of the heart and a suggestion of thickening around the base. Cross sections of or sectioning and closer examination of the apex lesion show multinodularity and thickening with penetration of the myocardium. We're talking a focal granulomatous myocarditis. However, examination of the base portion of the heart reveals these white firm lesions seen surrounding the major arteries, suggesting a multifocal location for this, our multifocal granulomatous myocarditis. Someone asked if this could look uh, like anything else, and yes, if I saw only this lesion alone without the lesion at the apex, there certainly would be no way I could differentiate this from a necessarily from malignant lymphoma on just appearance alone. Obviously on sectioning there would be a different consistency to the lesion. This lesion however turns out to be an amoebic granulomatous reaction and in this case specifically multifocal amoebic granulomatous uh, myocarditis and you can see the histiocytes and mixed mononuclear cells. Giant cells are not common in this slide, but we're seeing quite frequently in the sections. And we see represented here an example of the amoeba Balamuthia mandrillaris. This particular organism is, has been described in several gorillas and mandrill, as well as a couple of other animals at the, from the San Diego Zoo and elsewhere. The particular case represented here was from the Milwaukee Zoo and represents the only case, human or otherwise, found in Wisconsin. This is becoming a human problem in that, um, in particular, people who are immunosuppressed appear more susceptible. The organism is a free living soil or water organism that is found ubiquitously throughout the world and actually has become a, somewhat of a problem in Australia as well as the United States. CDC is currently um, pursuing studies on it through the parasitology division. Our next slide is a black and white colobus monkey. This animal has an interesting lesion represented here on this view of the uh, lungs, heart, and aorta as an ulcerative or erosive focal lesion in the vasculature or a focally erosive vasculitis. However, should this um, tissue be reversed, one sees an esophageal lesion that also is a penetrating uh, fistulous uh, lesion with um, erosion and necrosis. So necrotizing, erosive, fistulous, all of these terms can be used Essentially what has happened here is there is a fistula between the esophagus and the aorta um, in which the animal bled out into the mediastinum. The original penetrating wound was most likely in the esophagus and most, while not present now, was most likely caused by a foreign body. This is a Computian monkey and the, perhaps the slide should have been oriented the other way. This if you carefully look at the tissue, you can see it almost a slightly darker coloration to the center and a pale or lighter, more chalky white coloration here. This represents mineralization of the aorta. 
The, this aorta was stiff and firm and cracked when bent. If uh, held upright, it would stand straight up and represents what is sometimes known as a pipe stem aorta. On to the respiratory system. Within the macaque species, we see a condition represented by this set of lungs. Looking at the heart here, we see multiple lung lobes showing a almost diffuse hemorrhagic appearance with small strands of fibrin adhered to the serosal surface and small round to irregular lesions that are seen to rise above the surface of the lung representing what appears to be not just inflated alveoli but perhaps filling of the alveoli with a cellular content. One of the things to examine when looking at lungs is the the degree of inflation, has the, has the, have the lungs completely collapsed? Are they still fully inflated even though been they have been removed from the animal? This can indicate the amount of interstitial and, uh, and cellular infiltration in this. This represents a case of Haemophilus parainfluenza in a rhesus. It, also has a concomitant infection of coagulase positive staph. This is the monkey island at the Milwaukee Zoo for the Japanese macaques. There was a major outbreak of Haemophilus here in the 80s and several animals were lost. Oddly enough, both um, two of the animals that um, died were seen to commit a so-called suicide wherein they walked or fell into the water of the pond and made apparently no effort to struggle or get themselves out, but simply dropped down to the bottom and drowned. This was witnessed by both keepers and visitors to the zoo. These animals demonstrated the shaggy appearance of the fibrinopurulent serositis, and here we can see a bit of the pericarditis, pericarditis we saw before, but here the um, chloritis, and pneumonia of Haemophilus influenza. This lung is a diffuse hemorrhagic, well, diffuse to multifocal hemorrhagic appearance. You can see the deep red-purple coloration, and the, the peripheral edges seem to show some expansion. There's a wet appearance on sectioning. A great deal of fluid exudes from the lung, as there is a diffuse pulmonary edema. This is a case of acute respiratory distress syndrome, a condition that is often seen in man and also in the non-human primates. It represents a, an acute reaction to some respiratory insult. In this case, the animal was known to be infected with coagulase positive staph, and you see the prominent hemorrhage as well as the T2 cell proliferation, the alveolar macrophages, and the hallmark of the acute respiratory distress syndrome, the hyaline membrane formation. This lung is probably looks uh, familiar. It's a cross-section through a tuberculosis animal. We see multifocal granulomatous caseous le or casea necrotic lesions distributed throughout the lung in a somewhat orderly pattern, but are more often random. The on histological section, these represent central caseonecrotic tubercles surrounded by cellular inflammation. The next slide is a oil magnification of the an acid fast stain of this lesion with where the infection was known to be M tuberculosis. It is known, however, that or is seen in most human TB infections that actually these organisms are normally nowhere near this frequent and often you have to look quite a, a long time over the range of the slide to find even a few organisms. This represents a case of aspiration pneumonia. You see the, the cranial ventral orientation, the hemorrhage, 
and necrotic tissue apparent, particularly here, and a focal area of bullous emphysema, representing the fact that in this one area the inhalation exceeded the exhalation and trapped air in the peripheral edge of this lung lobe. This could be due to a partial obstruction of that particular airway or because of the necrosis and probable gangrenous inflammation, there is often uh, erosion into uh, adjacent airways, often causing, again, this um, bullous formation. The next few lungs represent a condition that it could be called classic in rhesus monkeys. Certainly it's one they like to show you uh, frequently. Infection by the uh, lung mite, pneumonisus semicola. The lesions are seen here, can, as seen here, can be either clear or pigmented, showing a somewhat linear orientation, and being raised irregular nodules extending above the surface of the lung pleura. A closer look, we can see that they can often be, sorry, uh, again somewhat irregular but often again linear. And here we can see the differentiation of the more severely pigmented lesions with, as contrasted to pneumoconiosis. This histological representation is of what is commonly called a mite house. As you can see where the raised lesion at, at the surface of the lung is represented. This is fibrous tissue, mixed inflammatory uh, cells and pigmentation forming a thickened wall around the cross section of the mite. In this lung we see a diffuse nodular showering throughout both lung lobes. On the section seen here, you can see that there is a smooth nodular surface, not an exudative example. And the, this represents a case of lymphoproliferative disease or lymphoma surrounding bronchi and perivascular spaces throughout the lung. This particular example, again, of a rhesus rec uh, represents metastatic colonic adenocarcinoma. And as you can see, the lung is almost completely replaced by these metastatic nodules, which on cut section, again, you can see quite clearly do not exude any liquid exudate and suggest metastatic tumor rather than inflammation. In the calotrichids, we have a golden lion marmoset. This animal sh has an acute onset of respiratory illness and death. We see a multifocal to confluent hemorrhage within the lung, as well as a lack of collapse. The suggestion here is of a somewhat interstitial involvement. And this is a E. coli pneumonia. This is a mustache wenon, Serapithecus cephus. The lungs seen, seen here are a severe example of pneumoconiosis. You can see the multifocal specks of black pigmentation. This animal lived in the Los Angeles Zoo for most of its life. And while that zoo is surrounded on three sides by major Los, or California freeways, um, this is what living in smog and that type of environment for any period of time will do to your lungs. This is a colobus monkey, and we see here that the lungs show a diffuse what I like to describe as glassy red appearance. You can see some raised alveoli that may still be somewhat aerated. However, the nature of the and appearance of these lungs suggests an interstitial and specifically viral interstitial infection. And this is 
herpes pneumonia in a colobus monkey. Because of the fact that we know these infections are necrotic, the proper di uh, morphological term for this would probably be a hemorrhagic necrotic pneumonia or necrohemorrhagic pneumonia. These are young bonobos or bonobos, pygmy chimpanzees. Their species are quite rare and um, even not only in the wild but also within zoological populations and they're considered quite valuable. The animal here was found dead suddenly after being observed in respiratory distress. The both onset and death were quite quick and the lungs show a mottled, diffused, confluent to diffuse hemorrhagic appearance which on sectioning also demonstrates marked pulmonary edema. Cultures of this animal were negative, both aerobic and anaerobic, fungal and um, viral. I'm sorry, the viral. And the histological sections revealed that it appeared to be a case of acute respiratory distress syndrome. Going back on these slides, note that the clinical disorders associated with acute respiratory distress syndrome are those causing a immediate insult to the lungs. They could be aspiration of gases or toxic contents, diffuse infections, sepsis, trauma, drug overdose. None of these are applied to this particular case. There was, however, a respiratory infection going through the entire uh, greater ape house, suggesting that perhaps this was a viral infection. And since influenza, uh, there was a major influenza outbreak in the city of Milwaukee at the time, we suspected possible uh, that influenza may have been the inciting cause. However, um, all our viral cultures on these, as I said, were negative, and the tissues were s and sections were sent to the AFIP, where not only did they find on immuno and PCR testing the could they find no evidence for viral infection, but the uh, influenza expert there also agreed that while this appeared to clearly represent a case of acute respiratory distress syndrome, it did not appear consistent with influenza. The pathogenesis of acute respiratory distress syndrome has to do with defects within the vascular permeability and damages that result in the surfactant functions being abnormal and the appearance of the, again, as noted before, hyaline membranes. In this slide, we can see the both necrotic uh, and separative neutrophilic cells and hemorrhage. Here we can see the interstitial cellular component and T2 prominent, uh, T2 hyperplasia with the prominent appearance of the hyaline membranes. These particular hyaline membranes are seen in only two uh, conditions, i.e. the acute respiratory distress syndrome and hyaline membranes, the membrane disease in the infant, both human or monkey. This is a galago. Often some species are called bush babies. These lungs represent, again, a diffuse hemorrhagic suppurative uh, pneumonia. Part of the reason we can tell this is suppurative because of the uh, caseus exudate seen here in the trachea, so that we also have a necrosuppurative tracheitis. The causative organism here is E. coli. Okay, our next slide here is a picture of the white-handed gibbon. This animal was presented dead with a um, acute course of uh, onset. Looking at the lungs, we see a diff again a somewhat diffuse hemorrhagic appearance. However, this particular lung, you can see there is a white area here that seems to represent possibly infiltration. It, more solid appearing um, sections, but this area seems to bulge, and if you look here, you can kind of see wrinkling as if the um, T2 
tissue had been sort of pushed together by um, expansion out and around it. If it were sectioned, we would notice this is actually a large abscess. This rec represent, I'm sorry, let's back up on that, represents a, um, a suppurative multifocal abscessing pneumonia. And cultures indicated that, uh, let's see, that we had a beta hemolytic coagulase positive staph. This slide is the lungs from a mandrel died with a uterine adenocarcinoma. The irregular nature of the um, infiltrates and the distribution irregularly through the sections would suggest a metastatic tumor sectioning through shows that these are solid lesions and this somewhat scalloped edge to that is always, I have always felt seem to associate more with um, tumor than actual uh, inflammatory lesion. So metastatic uterine carcinoma. This is a pato, Parodicticus pato. This animal was also presented with a metastatic lesion to the lung. We see flat raised nodules here, seeming lack of inflammation. There's a second slide which shows that there some variability as to the size and appearance, but again, no evidence of exudate, small area of still inflated lung. This is a colonic adenocarcinoma with metastasis to the lung. Digestive system. Diarrhea and digestive problems are probably one of the most common difficulties in non-human primates, but we're going to start here with the liver. This is an oddity. This when I necropsied this animal, there was a metallic clink when the knife nicked this particular area right here. If it is difficult to see, however, this refractile body represents a pellet, which is just barely penetrated the liver. It would appear this animal, which was wild caught, was probably shot at. Often they shoot at the mothers, trying to um, dislodge the young, take back the babies. Um, this animal, the bullet must have been at such a distance that the bullet penetrated the um, anterior abdomen and just barely entered the liver, apparently not causing enough hemorrhage to be of serious concern, and the animal has carried that pellet all these years. This particular slide is unusual, but represents um, not only telangiectasis within the lung, I'm sorry, within the liver, but also these pale areas are, appear to contain deposits of amyloid. Often the amyloid can be diffuse and collected in, the, in areas of the spleen and occasionally liver or in the uh, case of a, a different entity uh, seen as deposition within the islet cells of the pancreas period. This was an animal, rhesus, that was noted to have a fibrinosuppurative peritonitis. When the center of the inflammation was localized, it appeared to be the bile duct, where you can see there is a, a I'm sorry, a suppurative appearance with fibrin and exudate within what is a greatly dilated and necrotic bile duct. This represents cholidochitis. Um, there was no growth on bacteriological culture. However, antibiotics had been used on this animal. Um, Klebsiella and many other gram-negative organisms can be responsible for lesions such as this. The next slide represents a pale liver with a somewhat m mottled sinusoidal pattern. And if we notice here, we've seen some enlargement, apparently, to the gallbladder and associated nodes. If you look carefully, you can see patchy areas that appear slightly raised and pale. This animal 
had a myelogenous leukemia, which was treated. So there is not only the leukemia pro most likely infiltrating the liver, but also perhaps the effect of the anti-neoplastic drugs. When the animal died, it was found that it also seemed to show some lymph node enlargement. This represents a case of um, either uh, tapeworm cysts. This is echinococcosis, though species was not identified in the liver of a rhesus macaque. This lesion, which has been seen, um, has been uh, photographed and seen in other um, places, is a case of NOMA, N-O-M-A, a word meaning to devour, and is used to describe the upper maxillary lesion often seen in SRV monkeys, usually type 2, where a necrotizing stomatitis will often eat its way through not only the dental areas but also deep into the jaw. The condition is secondary to immunosuppression and it is reported that no particular bacterial organism has been attributed as causative though many have been found within the lesion, i.e. Borrelia, staph or anaerobic strep period. A recent report I have heard about suggests a possible spirochete may also be, may be present, but there is uh, studies, or let's say the studies still need to be done to prove this as not any, as anything more than an associative um, organism, period. Um, the oral mucosa seen here shows focal gingiva or multifocal gingiva hemorrhage, somewhat of a retraction of the gingiva, and is characteristic of vitamin C deficiency or scurvy in a rhesus macaque. This young rhesus monkey show, shows polydontia or extranumerate teeth can be seen within the oral cavity and behind the mandibular incisors. Looking at this lesion, we try to visualize the location, uh, we try to um, identify the tissue by uh, looking at the location, obviously within the thoracic cavity as evidenced by the ribs. We see the lungs and the heart, I think, under here. There's some prominence to these vessels. And we see a sort of dilated tubular structure here that on x-ray is seen as a megaesophagus. In this slide, we see the megaesophagus opened and the um, digestive content exposed, period. My apologies. It sounds like I'm trying to dictate here. <laughs> um, next slide. This is an evidence also of an SRV monkey and we see a candida infection in the esophagus and the oral cavity. You can see the sort of fungating caseonecrotic lesions, both linear, linear, linearly aligned along the esophagus and with, uh, in the oral mucosa. This is a rhesus macaque in a laboratory setting. Just to remind me that some conditions are seen more commonly in lab colonies and the gastric dilatation noted here is almost never seen in wild animals and the enlarged and dilated stomach contains a combination of gas and fluid. This condition has been speculated on for a number of years and the cause is still not completely understood. It was thought at some time that E. coli may be a causative organism. There are now a number of reports that 
Clostridium perfringens type A may be the cause of the gas formation. I have to be honest that many of the cases I have done, cultured both anaerobically and aerobically, have shown no organisms to speak of or what would be considered normal oral flora. The incidence is most likely more of a management problem than it is an infectious one and is often associated with changes in diet, drinking habits, uh, moving animals, uh, perhaps uh, too numerous abdominal explorations or other factors that would lead to an upset in normal routine and gastric flora. This represents a case of diverticulosis. This outpocking you know, of the colon is um, seen to catch bits of food material, often causing inflammation. And because the food is trapped there and can't leave, the inflammation becomes more severe, often creating a focus of intense pain for the animal. These next slides represent um, another aspect of the, the complex of retroperitoneal fibromatoses. This is a fibroproliferative multinodular process that begins at the ileocecal junction and spreads out over the mesentery, mesenteric nodes, and serosa of the intestines. The animal most commonly affected is the pig-tailed macaque, again, macaca nemestrina. The SRV serotype 2 is most often associated. Looking at these slides, we see a closer look at these flat, nodular, firm, fibrous plaques with what appears to be edgings of hemorrhage, as well as at the nodular, multinodular nature of the proliferation in the mesentery. Here we've moved to another case. This is a rhesus showing steatitis and a possible hemorrhagic pancreatitis. The clear to um, focal areas here show a evidence of uh, saponification and necrosis within this case. The coagulase positive staph was isolated from this animal. All right, we're going to start the second tape with a discussion of shigellosis in the old world macaques. Shigella flexneri or Shigella sonai are probably the two most common species, though dysentery is occasionally seen. Within flex uh, neri, there's a number of serotypes that are noted, some of which of greater or lesser virulency. The lesions are specific to the colon and are, do not become septicemic, nor do they invade the small intestine as usual. When you look at the lesions seen here, you notice that you know, as far as gross necropsy morphological diagnosis, you see very little of the liver. You do see the entire um, enteric, uh, or at least the superficial view of the abdominal region with a segmental hemorrhagic lesion in the colon. In this particular section, you can actually see the mucosa opened up with the multifocal, almost to diffuse necrotic process that is actually visible through the enteric wall. And again, creating these button ulcers In some cases, there, can only be, there may only be a small segment affected with focal necrosis and hemorrhage, which, when open, may show a mucosa, again, with focal hemorrhage. Um, petechia, you can see the ulceration or necrosis of the mucosa here and possibly edema within or infiltrates within the mucosa. This is a but another button ulcer representation of necrotic mucosa. And we're going to show several examples of the range uh, that these lesions can, uh, can take in appearance. And again, here, bits of fibrin, necrotic material, 
Again, perhaps more hemorrhage and necrosis as well as fibrin. Uh, pseudomembranous um, is not commonly used as much these days, but there is what used to be called the pseudomembrane or the fibrinopurulin exudate, uh, sloughing of the mucosa, uh, outer mucosal layer here, may perhaps less hemorrhage than seen in previous slides. Here you can see the segmental nature to it. This area seems to be less affected and the fact that other areas of the intestine are not affected. This particular slide represents um, an attempt on my part to teach you or to convince you that one, you should look at gross necropsy slides um, without prejudice. In other words, without knowing what it is you're looking for. This forces you to not only look at the lesion in, that is affected in particular and often exclusively, but also to look at everything that's there and make a judgment as to what your possible differentials can be. In this case, again, we have the same appearance of a intestinal lumen with um, marked hyperemia and fluid accumulation within the bowel loops. But as you can see, it's not confined to just the colonic portion, but extends through the small intestine also. Salmonella is one of those organisms that is often seen in the um, small intestine as well as the colon. This organism be can become septicemic. Clostridium infections can also be seen. The pseudomembranous um, enteritis reported in many reference books is actually um, a disease in calotrichids caused by Clostridium difficile. Uh, whether it is seen in macaques depends on whether perhaps which reference you're reading. However, the culture or isolation of Clostridium organisms in some of these enterocolitis is, is noted. And in this particular case, I did see some gram-positive bacteria lining segments of the bowel while, however, anaerobic cultures were negative. In fact, the uh, fecal growth was so low that um, the possibility of a serious um, or, uh, microbiological imbalance due to overuse of antibiotics might be considered. This is a lesson, case is a lesson in looking for um, perhaps other causes. This animal was brought in uh, after it was found dead. It uh, shows a severe fibrinopurulent peritonitis. You can see the marked degree of fibrin accumulation on the liver, but also uh, purulent rea uh, fibrinous reaction in the uh, thoracic cavity. Careful examination revealed a focal area of perforation in the lower distal colon, which apparently resulted from a biopsy. Um, this biopsy was done because of a chronic diarrhea this animal underwent, but the friable nature of the colon resulted in a perforation and an E. coli peritonitis for this animal. This cinemologous monkey shows a uh, prolapsed, uh, prolapsed colon rectum, uh, which on examination and retraction shows you a more um, darker discolored area that opened up indicates segmental hemorrhage. Interestingly enough, opening the entire GI tract reveals also a suppurative opaque exudate and or GI con or contact content of the intestines. This is another animal in which the, um, the cultures were negative for any significant organisms. However, it would appear that in some cases, histologically, you can see some grand negative rods adhered to the edge of necrotic mucosa. And in others, that there was villus blunting in a mononuclear cell infiltrate period. Antibiotic use may have contributed to the overall severity of the enteritis period. Oh, back to uh, parasites. This is esophagostinum in a ma old world monkey. You can see these focal dark lesions in the enteric serosa. 
these are the third stage larva which have insisted in the wall they may after maturity they may emerge again into the lumen but more often are uh, surrounded by an inflammatory reaction and found degenerate within these nodules again here are nodules seen along the intestinal wall this is Physolopterus uh, species probably Tumafacians the arthropod is an Im intermediate host usually a cockroach these are commonly found in the gastric mucosa of rhesus monkeys. This tapeworm is Bertiella studeri, seen in the small intestines of the rhesus. Here we see a um, rather too far view, but if you look carefully, you can see the increased size of the mesenteric lymph nodes, particularly at the ileocecal junction. This is a malignant lymphoma within the intestines. Often in some of these animals, there is a lymphoid proliferation within the intestinal segments that appears to be severe enough that it approaches neoplastic limits. In this particular animal, the neoplasia was in the particularly the ileocecal and mesenteric nodes, period. One of the more common lesions in the rhesus monkey, particularly in older animals, is a large mass palpated through the abdomen in the region of the ileocecal node. While the, there may or may not be enteritis or colitis present, this particular mass can often be inflamed, hemorrhagic and fibrinous, and associated with a lesion in the intestines or colon more likely colon in these areas, representing a scurus neoplastic process and or a colonic adenocarcinoma. As seen in this section, this is often annular and constrictive, showing a necrotizing process and metastases out in the surrounding tissue period. This lesion represents another unknown. Um, I'd like you to look here at this necrotic area, which appears to have a somewhat brown fluid exudate. And the necrosis associated with this, as well as this large fibrous area. Superficially, this would, might seem to resemble some of the ileocecal adenocarcinomas we have seen before. However, areas such as this and this and here represent small foci of what appears to be either hemorrhage or proliferation. And attention should be paid to these because they represent foci of endometrial proliferation within the wall and outside the limits of the uterus period. Endometriosis is a condition wherein the endometrium epithelium is exuded perhaps through the fallopian tube out into the abdominal cavity where it implants upon the, the serosa of various intestinal segments or perhaps in other open areas of the abdomen. If the degree of activity of that piece of glandular epithelium is high, there may be actual secretions corresponding with those in the normal ovulation cycle. And often fluid can build up leading to a focus of digested blood suggesting a chocolate cyst. This may be represented by the lesion here. These other small lesions represent a multifocal endometrial invasion or endometriosis. Here's an example of the, one of these black areas from the outside and from the inside. As you can see, the lesions are contained within the mucosal wall. 
This is a common marmoset demonstrating the sublingual appendage that is the source of some confusion. The um, prosimians all show a structure called the dental comb, which is an adaption of the lower incisors with lateral flattening and extension forward, allowing these animals to groom their fur. A, the sublingual appendage in these animals is small and triangular with a somewhat serrated edge, which is used to get hair out of these combs. The marmosets and tamarins do not have dental combs. However, it is noted that the common marmoset here and a cottontop marmoset do show the sublingual appendage. Its purpose is unknown. It's far more developed than the last cottontop marmoset I posted, showing a little triangular structure laying flat on the bottom of the uh, oral cavity and often showing a somewhat serrated edge. So grooming tongue is a term that was once uh, heard given to it. We will call that, um, can call it that, or the sublingual appendage perhaps would be more appropriate. It may be a vestigial piece of tissue from the pro lower prosimian growth. This is a liver from a marmoset. The bronze nature of it suggests a hemochromatosis or hemosiderosis condition. The small green oh, cysts or certainly small fluid-filled areas represent bile cysts. Hemochromatosis or hemosiderosis in the marmoset represents a iron overload situation. Marmoset lives in an area that is heavy in tannins. These tannins interfere with the normal iron absorption, and so they have adapted a mechanism in, other to, in order to absorb the amount of iron they need, making them a super iron absorber. Diets often have to be adjusted to cut back on the amount of iron given. And there are various iron toxicity studies being done with these animals. But here, we see, as I say, we see a demonstration of hemosiderosis, hemochromatosis. In the case of um, hemosiderosis, there's deposit of the iron pigment within the protein-bound section of the liver. Once you exceed that protein binding, however, you often start getting cellular infiltration and portal fibrosis, suggest, uh, leading to a diagnosis of hemochromatosis, period. Next slide. This is... A, let's see, looks like a pygmy marmoset, Cibuela, Cibuela pygmyi. This animal was found dead, demonstrating a patomegaly. In this case, this represents a case of amyloidosis, though this would be difficult to tell. All you may tell here, perhaps, is you have a further extension down into the abdomen than normally seen by the outline of the liver. The swelling, all of which could be due to other causes as well as amyloid period. This cotton top tamin, tamarin, Sanguinus oedipus, sh showed a cystic bile duct, a dilation of the duct as well as the lower bile sac, and it could be considered a variant on normal structure, period. This animal is a cotton top marmoset showing a not easily seen multifocal ne necrotizing lesion in the liver. However, what's pertinent in this case is that there also seems to be a lymph node enlargement here, and in Yersinia enterocolitica, which this is, and particularly in some marmosets and TD monkeys, it is noted that this multifocal necrotizing hepatitis is most often accompanied also by a caseous or ne necrotizing mesenteric lymphadenitis, period, um, with subsequent uh, peritonitis in those cases that become more severe. This particular animal is another cotton top marmoset. Notice the liver here is swollen. You can see multifocal areas of necrosis. And this animal was in, had a pseudomonas a originoso infection of the liver. So multifocal necrotizing hepatitis of pseudomonas origin. 
this infection, which is a more chronic nature, is demonstrated by the marked fibrin accumulation surrounding the liver, the separative nature of the lesion on sectioning, and the changes within the hepatic parenchyma itself, period. On careful dissection, it is noted that the seat of the separative reaction appears to be the greatly thickened gallbladder, making this a necrosuppurative fibrinonecrotic cholecystitis. The pancreas here shows multiple fos nodules which represent islet cell tumor in a golden lion tamarind. The intestines here are from an animal with chronic wasting disease. However, what we're looking at is this indisusception right here. This is a common finding in marmosets and for the most part is an agonal lesion showing no changes in the mucosa when separated. This one, however, would appear to be within a already irritative and as we can see somewhat edematous and swollen intestine. The uh, intussusception is reduced and you can see an area of hyperemia and or hemorrhage right here. This animal shows a wet appearance to the abdomen and tissues suggesting ascites. Looking at the closer at the intestines, we can see discoloration of the mesenteric nose as well as black nodules within the intestinal walls. This histopathology slide reveals the prosthenorchus organism as it impacts within a wall, you can see the nodular enlargement over the head and recognize that in cases where there is perforation, there will also be subsequent peritonitis. This common marmoset appears to be somewhat alert and healthy with a nice strong uh, appearance and uh, fur coat. This, however, is how they often appear when submitted with chronic wasting syndrome. There is a marked patchy alopecia as well as scruffy coat. The enteritis is not usually hemorrhagic and is usually represented by fluid filled bowels or soft feces. There is at times some hyperemia and thickening of the intestinal wall. These areas demonstrate a somewhat commonality of diarrhea and wasting or weight loss, and, but often show a different uh, histological picture. Chronic wasting syndrome has been looked at in marmosets for a number of years and has been blamed on a, a number of different theories. Uh, protein in the diet or lack of protein in the diet, vitamin E, selenium the possibility of a gluten enteropathy, though there's some uh, similarity in appearance. Paramyxoviruses have been seen in the intestines of some of these animals and at C. bagaigi there is a report of a nematode within the pancreas of these animals that is Trichospira leptostoma. These wasting syndromes are reported from a number of different facilities across the country and actually the world. Interestingly enough, I myself are, am doing the necropsies for two colonies which are totally different in their genetic background but which are housed in the same facility though in separate rooms but with the same diet and caretakers, etc. The incidence between, uh, incidence difference between these two colonies is quite striking with one colony that showing a 
large number of found dead animals posted showing chronic wasting disease and the others showing next to none. One of the things the um, Wisconsin Regional Primate Center has published and is working on is the presence of a new gamma herpes virus, gamma herpes virus calotricid 3 in the mucosa of these animals. They often react to EB virus and the appearance of the gut appear is that of a lymphocytic enteritis with a de variable degree of lymphocytes that show from anything from a mild inflammation to a severe almost neoplastic inflammation that may also affect the mesenteric lymph nodes. It is thought this continuum of symptomology might very well represent a response to a viral infection and studies are being continued on the marmosets of that colony and any they might accept from the outside in order to determine if this is a legitimate organism and a cause of the serious wasting syndrome period. Um, Baskin in his handout mentions that marmoset lymphocryptovirus also causes wasting syndrome. Um, it would appear that this could either be another name or simply another variant or disease or <laughs> variant of the virus that they are seeing there. This is by no means a certainty and most current reference on this is uh, Jan Raymer in Comparative Pathology in 2000. We see here a, um, back up for a second, you can see some of the um, mesenteric nodes in this animal are slightly enlarged. And again, the fluid filled um, intestinal loops in the lymphocytic enteritis, there's a villus atrophy, whereas in the paramyxovirus histologically, you see a different picture with syncytial cells and hyperplastic crypt cells. Um, this particular case is uh, again showing a mesenteric lymphadenopathy and with an area here demonstrates a ileocecal adenocarcinoma also. So you may have chronic um, enteritis as well as any aplastic condition. The, uh, one of the causes of wasting disease was once thought to be the rectal adenocarcinoma that's often seen in cotton top marmosets as demonstrated here and which they found in large numbers but which nobody else seemed to duplicate, period. The um, appearance of these tumors is quite distinctive. However, there are numerous colonies which it, it, the incidence was much lower than that reported in the Tennessee group, period. All right, looking at, uh, taking a look at this slide. This is a cotton top tamarin also showing a tumor, but as you can see by the proliferation here, this is a ileocecal carcinoma. I'm going to back up here two slides. Oh, well, sorry, I can't do that. We're already in the beginning of the new carousel. Um, two slides back, what we looked at, I want to make a mention that we mentioned a rectal adenocarcinoma uh, around the mesenteric lymph nodes, and that is, was very small and maybe very difficult to discern. Mostly the lymphadenopathy associated with the enteritis was more noticeable. Here, however, you can see the neoplastic involvement quite clearly. This is a red-handed, or actually now called a golden-handed uh, tamarin, sanguineus mitis. And we see here what's called uh, peritoneal filariasis. 
If you focus on the surface of the viscera, you can see these white to clear thread-like worms. These are uh, filaria, dipedal anema, cotyspina, seen innocuous, innocuously it, within the abdominal cavity. Different other species are seen in, on serosal membranes or in subcutaneous tissues. There's usually little reaction to this infection. This is reported in a variety of New World monkeys. Looking at other species, we have here a colobus with a multifocal necrotizing hepatitis. You see these large caseonecrotic lesions that represent a granulomatous to suppurative to granulomatous reaction within the liver. This is Entamoeba histolytica, commonly um, seen in leaf-eating monkeys, particularly colobus, proboscis, or langurs. It, the incidence in these particular species has to do most likely with the saccular stomach and the change of physiology. This imparts to the GI tract of these animals. Not only is the liver infected, but commonly also the organism can be found in the gastric mucosa. This is a mongoose liver. This is one of our unknowns. Um, trying to get you to look at the slide without any pre um, prejudging by being told the diagnosis. What we're looking here is we can see this gold red coloration suggestive of perhaps cholestasis and a bit of jaundice. We see the um, multifocal areas here. They seem to be actually more plaque-like on the surface and may represent a fibrin accumulation. This animal was known to show a pseudomonas infection but does not show any particular um, suppurative necrosis perhaps a bit of fibrin, and certainly cultures and histology would be needed to further define the condition. We're looking here at the mouth of a bonobo with mycotic stomata uh, granulomatous stomatitis or uh, mycotic stomatitis, a candida albicans. This animal suffered from a preeclamptic condition in DIC, dying, and the Candida infection is most likely a result of the long antibiotic therapy and end-stage renal disease. This bush baby shows a necrotizing glossitis. Possible etiologies it can be bacterial, E. coli, enterobacter. However, most laboratory animal clinicians would probably suggest that you should also check for herpes T or tamarinus. Um, to be certain that, that we do not have a viral infection. This is the gastric mucosa of a colobus. The hemorrhagic and necrotizing nature is characteristic, well, is, can be characteristic of a viral infection. In this case, it's a necrohemorrhagic viral gastritis. This is a better look at the entire gastric sac or stacular stomach of the um, leaf eating monkey, and specific the colobus. We can see here the small portion, which represents the glandular area of the stomach, and then the saccular region, which shows a hyperemia and superficial necrosis of the mucosa. A close up here shows again foci of hemorrhage. And this particular animal had an Enterobacter agglomerans gastritis. This is a normal structure in your great apes, in particular gorilla appendix. You can see the small structure on the left. This is the abdominal cavity of a colobus monkey. This is a millifer arm mollatus in the abdomen. It's a um, pentastome, which is an aberrant arthropod nymph. The adults are found in the navel, nasal patches of canines, canids, other animals, and humans. It's often asymptomatic, though it can lead to peritonitis. 
This degenerative arthropod is common to the old world monkeys, whereas porocephalus is a species seen in new world monkeys. Cross sections in the um, abdomen reveal not only the acidophilic granular bodies seen commonly in these, but also the striated muscle that lines this cavity and the hooks and sucker. <coughs> this mass of tissue represents a, the abdominal contents of a western lowland gorilla infected with Echinococcus vogeli. Each of these masses represents either a live or dead hydatid cyst. You can see infestation or infection within the liver itself, and the separative material here represents an area of separative change. The cause of death in most of these animals is strangulation of the um, intestines, and many of the female gorillas that were infected had to have cesareans in order to deliver their young. The entire group was infected when received as young animals, and they were kept in a nursery where they were given freedom in the yard, alternatively with raccoon dogs. Unfortunately, it was not considered that the feces of the raccoon dog, while it was, may have been removed, also shed and infected the young primates who, of course, were eating the dirt and putting everything in their mouth with the Echinococcus. All of these animals developed large abdominal infections, and the trauma that they often inflict on each other caused cysts to rupture and multiple sub-daughter cysts to form. This is an ultrasound of the abdomen of one of these animals showing the numerous cystic structures. It's a cross-section of a fixed specimen showing the various hydatid cysts. At one time, an attempt was made to treat these animals, and this particular cyst is seen to have died and now shows a somewhat necrotic appearance. However, there was never more, um, more than a small minority of cysts that died. Most were still viable. This is hydatid sand, and you can see the small hooks present within the organisms. Um, a reminder that balantidium is often considered somewhat controversial in non-human primates. In many cases, you see it in normal mucosa, and it's considered an incidental finding, as in here. In other cases, and in particular in great apes, it causes a quite severe enteral colitis and has, off, has been seen in some cases to invade the uh, submucosa, often penetrating through into the mesentery and sometimes causing a severe peritonitis and being then found in mesenteric lymph nodes and where there is a lymphadenitis. This is not as common in the lesser monkeys, but the great apes it has been reported frequently and suggests that any time this is seen in any great numbers, it must be treated, period. Um, lymphohematopoietic system. The macaques, this is our monkey with the myelogenous leukemia again and the hepatic lesions. This animal demonstrated a white count of over 200,000 while it was, when it was diagnosed. This is an example of a blood smear with the um, immature granulocytic cells. A section of the liver at death reveals that the population appears to be becoming more of a mononuclear cell population, not many of which of these cells do show any type of granulocytic differentiation. Uh, examination of the lymph nodes reveals enlargement and monomorphic proliferation, which on a Touch imprint suggests a lymphomatous proliferation and a malignant lymphoma was indeed 
diagnosed on top of the granulocytic leukemia. This is not an uncommon sequelae after treatment in either the great apes, of which, of course, such um, episodes have been few, but in humans it is far more common. This is a blood smear from a marmoset in which a trypanosome can be seen. This is probably trypanosome minocense, a innocuous um, organism here that causes little problem. These animals, however, can also be infected with T. cruzi, which, though rarely, can cause a myocarditis. Picture of the accessory spleen in a gorilla. Just a small extra piece of spleen, either squeezed off or formed separately. And this is a dwarf lemur who was seen on necropsy to have a hemoabdomen with marked hemorrhage and blood clots seen within the abdomen. Closer examination reveals the spleen showed a ruptured hemangiosarcoma with other multinodular proliferations seen within the body of the tissue. Metastatic hemangiosarcoma can also be seen in the liver. This slide is again a white-handed gibbons, the same animal we have seen previously, showing a swollen fatty liver and an extremely large fibrinous, fibrinonecrotic spleen. Closer look at the spleen revealed in both the fibrin and the multifocal necrosis seen throughout the tissue. This was a beta-hemolytic coagulase positive staph septicemia. Your genital system. Um, frequently in research institutions, the uh, rhesus monkeys or cinemologous monkeys are vasectomized to prevent breeding. Samples are often sent to the pathologist as biopsies to determine the presence of the vas deferens. In this particular case, we found no evidence of vas on sectioning and the entire testicle is removed, wherein it was seen that the vas deferens had occupied an entirely different path within the scrotum. This is a separative material at the umbilical cord, at the base of the umbilical cord of a young rhesus, indicating a separative omphalitis. It's the Japanese macaque and um, showing cystic form, or cystic fibrinous, I don't want to say calculi, or calculi with quotations. As you can see in the next slide, these bodies are laminated fibrinous material. The infection was unable to be identified, probably due to heavy antibiotic use. However, the, the urinary bladder itself is hemorrhagic and somewhat proliferative. So we have a, necro a hemorrhagic fibrinonecrotic cystitis. This is a normal placenta for a rhesus by discoid hemochorial. And this series of slides represent the condition endometriosis in the rhesus, one of the more common conditions seen in older female rhesus monkeys. It can cause considerable pain and discomfort as well as serious risk of incarceration of sections of the intestines and subsequent death. There is a variety of lesions, but all appear to be bits of the endometrial epithelium, which have escaped most likely via the fallopian tube out into the abdominal cavity and implanted themselves upon the serosal surface of the intestines, uterus, or other mesenteric structures, or even the peritoneal membranes. These bits of epithelium may be quiescent or they may secrete in synchronization with the animal's normal ovulation cycle, in which case they may secrete blood, but being as they are not in the uterus, this blood will get caught in a sac with 
the body making an attempt to wall it off. The sac may get bigger and bigger, often with showing digestion of the previous blood shed and becoming what is often called a chocolate cyst. What the lesion we saw in the intestines as an unknown back under digestive tract represented rupture of a probable chocolate cyst. One of the first things you look for in the abdomen is the fact that the inflammation seems to center over the caudal aspect of the abdomen, particularly around, perhaps around the uterus. Some identifications are easier than others. In this one, there's this marked hemorrhage with uh, hemorrhagic cysts apparent in the section. In other areas, as in the one we looked at previously, black implanted tissue in the abdominal wall, I'm sorry, in the intestinal wall can be seen to represent areas of endometrial implantation. Here's again another look at the, hemor at the hemorrhagic portion. Here also with bulging cysts. And this is an example of the one where, that we saw that showed the focal necrotic lesion, which may have been a chocolate cyst. This, the nodules or foci seen within this wall represent implantation not only outside the uterus, but also within the uterine wall. This condition, termed adenomyosis, is used to define endometrium that has strayed outside the endometrial lining, but is still within the serosal capsule of the uterine body itself, usually approximately two field lengths away from the inner epithelium. And again, it probably responds to the normal ovulation cycle, though perhaps to a lesser extent. This is a normal uterus. Uh, let's put it this way. This is a uterus with a retained placenta rather than an endometriitis or endometriosis. This fetus was submitted as a stillbirth. Most likely it was an intrauterine death. Um, clues to that are the slippage of skin and loss of hair with poor constructs of the limbs and body. In particular, this yellow cheesy material adhered to it suggests meconium exposure. In cases of fetal distress syndrome, meconium is evacuated from the lower bowel where it is deposited as a waste product of the body's metabolism. Normally this doesn't happen until after birth, but if it should happen in the uterus, it's, expo it's expelled into the amniotic cavity. The animal that will then inhale it, there's a quite serious pneumonia associated with this, but also is the fluid may rupture and dry out. The meconium can be adhered to the infant and becomes on the abortion a indication that the animal suffered a fetal distress episode resulting in this expulsion and staining of not only the fetus but the placenta. This is a kidney showing a focal lesion tumor. It's a nephroblastoma. This is the normal placenta of the calotricid triplets showing the two umbilical cords in one of the bidiscoid structures and a single umbilicus on the other. This is polycystic kidneys in a galago. You can see not only this severe numerous external renal uh, spaces, but also those within the uh, cut surface, some of them quite large. This is an orangutan. This orang sh uh, was found dead, showed a infarct, both hemorrhagic and necrotic within the kidney. On cross-section, you can see the penetration into the kidney cortex and again the focal hemorrhagic or more acute infarct. Here again we have renal cysts. 
but we have these depressions and old infarction lesions that can be seen in some chronic infections when asked for the two conditions present, both renal cysts and chronic infarction need to be mentioned. This cr uh, cross section of the kidney contains a single small nodule which on histopathology was revealed to be a benign tubular um, I'm sorry, adenoma. This is the accessory sex glands of a ring-tailed lemur. The seminal vesicles are greatly distended both and in an asymmetrical fashion and the granular fluid contained within represents a overabundance or blockage of the normal seminal secretions period. Paraovarian cyst over is slightly on the other side. This is a paraovarian cyst is from the remnant of the Wolfian duct. This is the placenta of a bonobo. Unfortunately, the fresh placenta, the pictures of the fresh placenta were lost, and an attempt was made to pull this uh, placenta out of formalin and retake the pictures. You can still see the focal area of hematoma formation that occurred behind the placenta between it and the uterine wall. This is an abrupt show placenta. When the uh, normal uterus contracts and separates from the placenta, there is constriction of the vessels, which stops the bleeding that happens on separation. However, in cases of separation prior to birth and contracture, there is often enormous bleeding contained underneath the placenta, which interferes with normal blood supply and causes usually an abortion of the fetus also. This cross-section is it showing some thickening pale areas and um, a focal area of hemorrhage. Looking at the um, bonobo itself, this animal aborted the um, fetus and approximately uh, three to four days later was noted to be quite ill, well, was noted to be ill several days later and was treated but became seriously ill and had to be hospitalized. IV fluids and antibiotics, steroids, etc., were instituted. However, the animal continued to deteriorate. This was a case of preeclampsia, the existing conditions of hypertension, fetal ischemia, and DIC uh, were noted as is usually seen in eclampsia. The or preeclampsia. You can see here the pale, swollen kidneys as well as the still enlarged uterine body. Opening the uterus, you still see residual placenta and hemorrhage. The kidneys are, again, you may see here a pale with petechia. These represent end stage renal failure. The Defects of the spiral arteries in the placenta contributed to the abrupt show and eclampsia. Here you see necrosis and hemorrhage, and here a fibrinoid necrosis around the small vessels and increase in cytotrophoblasts and syncytial knots. The abnormal de physiological development of the spiral arteries in this condition leads to the hypertension, which then is exacerbated by the placental structure and spirals down to a DIC and end stage organ failure. In the case that this is caught early and the baby is removed immediately, there can be complete recovery. However, once the baby is aborted, you usually have reached a stage of complete organ failure and death is inevitable, whether it be great apes. All right, our next slide is a colobus monkey showing um, kidneys lesions, we can see the black discoloration indicating severe hemorrhage, the white nodules suggesting necrosis. And here the 
kidneys have been separated out as well as the necrotic material. We can see the uh, areas of necrosis, hemorrhage, discoloration. These are a necrohemorrhagic pyelonephritis. You can see the white spots here also indicating necrosis. The organism here was E. coli. All right, moving on to the musculoskeletal system. We see here an, a lesion called pectum excavatum, or a trough like sternum. This, um, we have a similar appearance to this marmoset, common marmoset um, thorax, except this would appear to be due more to abnormalities of the bone formation of the ribs and sternum. As you can see here, they have irregular outlines, none of which appear to be similar to those adjacent to it. There's an irregularity and also a um, osteomalacia that, or osteodystrophy that appears to be most likely due to a combination of the malnutrition and um, serious renal fa uh, disease in these animals. Many of these bones can be either bent and are quite soft. Um, in addition to these bony lesions seen in the animals with the renal disease and wasting, there is another lesion seen in the common marmoset colonies at the Wisconsin Primate Center that appears to be a perhaps pagetoid-like reaction in the young marmosets that is currently under study, period. This slide, which could perhaps be um, a little lighter, demonstrates a spondylitis or bridging spondylitis of the vertebral column of a mandrel. You can see this, I'm um, having trouble with the pointer here, along the lower outline. The hip joint here represents a case of DJ, DJD or degenerative joint disease with necrosis loss of the cartilage over the head of the femur. This particular section is thought to represent congenital osteopetrosis in a, in a newborn gorilla. The osteop congenital osteopetrosis is a defect of osteoclasts and either differentiation or function. You get a lack of reabsorption, so your bone remodeling lays down but never re uh, removes, and you often get this characteristic V-shape in the center of the bone. This is a black and white colobus. We see here a focal area of hemorrhage and possible necrosis along the iliopsoas muscle. Closer examination reveals that there is not only a necrotizing process that is eroded into the vasculature, but marked hemorrhage, and that on histological examination, there are numerous bacteria colonies and inflammatory cells present. This is called an iliopsoas myositis. It is an entity also seen in man, and in man is most likely, or is most often associated with an acute, or I'm sorry, not acute, but a chronic appendicitis. We have one eye case. This is an SIV monkey in which this quite striking lesion was seen surrounding the one eye this hemorrhagic and swollen conjunctiva actually represents an infiltration of malignant, malignant lymphoma cells and is likely associated with the immunosuppressive effects of the SIV infection. In the central nervous system, this particular brain is from a rhesus monkey. You see not only some swelling with closure of gyri, but also focal areas of collapse 
associated with a hydrocephalic condition. E. coli was the etiological agent for the meningitis. In this close-up, you can see the swelling indicating the brain edema and some slight petechiation. This particular case represents a young cinemologist with a brain cap or pro with probes which extend down into the brain. Great care must be taken both in placing and maintaining these caps, otherwise contamination is all too easy. In this case, you can see on the one side the probe looks relatively clean, while on the other there is a, a more irregular and perhaps uh, exudative response. This is a strep infection, or I'm sorry, a staph infection noted within the brain itself and in the overlying meninges. We have here a young rhesus submitted as a possible stillborn. On necropsy, however, while there was little in the abdominal or thoracic cavities, the head seemed to be somewhat markedly reddened, and subcutaneous examination revealed extensive hemorrhage of the subcutaneous tissue and the bony plates of the cranium with actual overlapping of these plates and focal areas of penetration with accompanying hemorrhage within the brain. These areas look suspiciously like bite wounds, suggesting a um, trauma case and probable uh, adult trauma within the group. Now, the fact that there is this extensive hemorrhage in the subcutaneous tissue would indicate that this was not a stillbirth, that the animal was born alive but died from severe uh, cranial trauma shortly thereafter. In another case of a marmoset showing a result of a fall and in which the animal struck its head, we can see that there is hemorrhage not only in and under the lepto meninges and over the brain with small blood clots present. You can actually see what may be a ruptured vessel here. But also the contra coup or resulting hemorrhage from the blow of the brain hitting the opposite side of the skull after the original originating impact. This common marmoset is noted to have uneven pupils, and this was apparent even after death. Examining the brain of this animal revealed marked swelling of the cerebrum. This picture in particular tends to illustrate uh, the closure of the central sulcus due to this swelling and edema. In case you are Remarking on the lack, utter lack of sulci and gyri out in the cerebral hemispheres, please ex note on the previous case that these animals do not have any of these structures. Another uh, marmoset brain that was examined, this is a Geldes, was seen after several days of odd behavior and listlessness after what may have been a possible traumatic incident. Examination of the skull reveals a focal hematoma which was seen to place pressure causing this divot-like compression of the brain material in the one cerebral hemisphere. Here you can see the, more, the normal prominence to the central sulcus. 
This is a brain from the orangutan with the uh, renal infarct. The organism in question here is strep pneumonia, the cause of the most common cause of meningoencephalitis in great apes and, and the primates, non-human primates. You can see the separative exudate here over the surface of the brain, also to a lesser extent at the base of the brain. Another picture of a lowland gorilla in which we lead off into a discussion of the amoebic meningoencephalitis in lowland gorillas. This particular animal was noted to show a left side or left arm weakness which proceeded to become worse and did not respond to therapy. The animal then began exhibiting CNS signs and was taken for an MRI. The initial MRI showed no lesions, however, a secondary MRI done a week later showed distinct lesions within portions of the brain as seen here. A tentative diagnosis of uh, fungal encephalitis was made and treatment instituted with no effect. The animal deteriorated badly and was finally euthanized in extremis. You can see here that the brain shows evidence of little in the way of obvious gross lesions. These lines here are the biopsy sites and the MRIs were found to be invaluable in determining the sites of biopsy for obtaining samples. Um, cultures were sent off for both bacteria and virus as additional samples were also placed in the ultra low freezer for possible use later. When viral and bacterial cultures were negative if, and histopathology was examined. It was determined, well first we'll take a look at some of the um, areas that show a slight discoloration. You can see the petechia and slight darkening here. Um, perhaps more obvious is some of the areas here associated with the um, areas noted on the MRI. But on histological section, you can see that there was actually almost a complete effacement of normal cerebral tissue and that often large areas were affected in these, um, showing either one of two patterns. In this particular slide, you can see the more mononuclear cell infiltration with the amoebic organism within histiocytes, while the cardiac lesions showed a number of giant cells. These were much rare in the cerebral sections. Interestingly enough, none of these organisms became more obvious under special stains. None of the stains such as PS, which are sometimes used to show other amoeba, worked on this particular organism, Balamuthia mandrillaris. Here is an a example of another area in which there is an amoebic form within a large histiocyte, and it is noted that many of these amoeba appear to be associated with large numbers of neutrophils in an almost abscess-like pattern that was often seen in the same section and sometimes overlapping in the brain. This particular gorilla, an another gorilla, was seen to show a bilateral weakness and progressive inability to control both the pelvic and forelimbs. The clinicians felt this might re seem to resemble uh, AML or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis and neural exams were done and a myelogram done at the uh, veterinary school. It was seen, however, that most of the spinal cord, the animal deteriorated, um, the myelogram was negative and the animal deteriorated was euthanized. Most of the uh, spinal cord on gross examination was 
unremarkable as seen here. However, a small portion of the cervical node between C1 and C2 was seen to show a depressive lesion that was not only chronic but was also recently acute. In other words, what we speculated was that there appeared to be a vertebral instability there putting chronic pressure on the cervical cord that created an old lesion upon which a newer, more acute traumatic lesion appears to have been superimposed. A cross section showing myelin staining of the cervical cord reveals this lack of myelin in the lateral columns that is seen down the entire cord of this animal and accounted for both the weakness and spinal deficit signs seen in clinical examination. The last case involves another gibbon in which there was paresis and paralysis on necropsy. The cord was removed and there appears to be thickening of the tissues surrounding the outer nerve roots and on cross section you can see this almost jelly-like proliferation surrounding the spinal cord on um, histologic section. This appears to be a malignant lymphoma. That concludes this lecture and the on the pathology of the non-human primate.